Whirlpool is about to show you something in appliance quality you may never have seen before. A refrigerator that monitors itself to help protect your food. A microwave oven that uses a built-in computer to simplify your cooking. A dishwasher you can program to start hours later. And a laundry pair with electronic controls for today's fabrics. Whirlpool has created its first family of quality appliances with solid-state technology because we want you to have the benefits of solid-state right now. The 21st century is only a little more than three decades ahead of us. These newborns will be 34 years old when it dawns. In one sense, the 21st century is with us now. We are making it today. Some of our finest minds are engrossed in it in our universities, at the great foundations, in our medical research laboratories. The world of the year 2000 is taking its first shape. Those who make the study of the future their primary concern, the futurists, are looking toward the sea, more than 70% of this planet Earth, a frontier as compelling as space, a frontier where man is not only expected to work, but to live in the 21st century. And in space, that other great frontier, what do the futurists see? They see a base on the moon. They see us exploring Mars and Venus. They see unmanned probes moving into a greater realm, the void beyond our solar system. But there may be more exciting frontiers than inner or outer space. These too will involve exploration, explorations into the very core and essence of man. The revolution in biology will have been to the last half of the 20th century, what automobiles, aviation, and electronic communications were to the first half. For those who think seriously about the 21st century, the gadgets and gimmicks and much of the physical hardware are secondary. They do not see utopia, but promise with problems. Will cities still be choked? Air pollution still with us? Overpopulation threatening to smother us? And above all, will nuclear war make the 21st century an empty, unfulfilled dream? In the weeks ahead in this series, we will explore these promises and these pitfalls. Explore them with some of the men who are thinking most profoundly about the future. With these men, we will be looking ahead at a world that lies a little more than three decades away. The future cannot be predicted, the experts tell us, but it can be determined if people understand and then decide what they want the world of tomorrow to be. Understand and then decide may be the key to that hazy, promising, frightening world we call the 21st century. Communications explosion has begun. From fragments of the present, we glimpse an image of the future. Many of the possibilities of 21st century communications are before us now. Which will we choose? We are creating a new world with electronics, a world in which micro-miniaturized circuits are compressing time and distance into a matter of seconds. Can instant communications end human ignorance and distrust? The communications explosion will affect us in a multitude of ways. British science and science fiction writer Arthur C. Clarke believes it will even affect our telephone numbers. I think we'll each be given a number at birth, and that'll be our telephone number for the rest of our lives. And anyone who knows that number can call us where we are, anywhere in the world. They won't have to know where we are even. They'll just dial that number. It'll be quite a number. It'll be about 12 digits. And uh, our Not telephone Not counting the area ring. code. Not counting the area code. Different one for Earth and Moon, of course. And um, they'll get us, unless, of course, we switch the thing off to get some sleep. It means that no one could ever be lost again. Uh, and it, there might, in an emergency, you might be able to press a button, and they would send out an SOS signal, and you'd be found. You, that signal would be pinpointed by another directional satellite. And just think of the thousands of lives that would save every year. What will communications be like in the 21st century? Today, orbiting satellites like this, spinning high above the Earth, relay signals around the world. 
Tomorrow, satellites could be the key to a worldwide network of information, education, and entertainment. The age of the communication satellite has just begun. Three communication satellites orbiting at the same speed as the Earth rotates could link any two spots on the globe. Going straight up. And stand by to super. Mexico is on the line. Stand by to wipe to the bird and wipe. In 1945, 12 years before the space age, Arthur C. Clarke offered a plan that proved to be prophetic. Uh, as you know, I'm rather bugged on communication satellites since I've been it's exactly 21 years ago that I wrote the um, basic paper on the synchronous communication satellite. So it's quite a lusty baby now. And this is going to revolutionize global communications because it's going to make the world one village. I think, was it Marshall McLuhan used the phrase, the global village? Uh, I'm looking forward with great interest to uh, direct broadcasting from ComSats. This was really my original, pro uh, my original suggestion, uh, broadcasting direct into the home from large communication satellites, not going through the local ground stations. This will be technically possible, certainly within five years. Whether it will be economically possible is another question, but it will be technically possible. And then you'll be able to tune in to Russian, Chinese, European broadcast TV direct, wherever you are. Well, the effect of this is going to be tremendous in both directions. It means that we can talk to the Chinese and they can talk to us and nobody on either side can stop it. But when you look very far ahead, then you have a sort of competition between transportation and communication. As communications improve out of all, all recognition, so that in your own home you can have instant access through possibly ultimately all the senses, not just vision and hearing, to any remote spot on Earth, or, uh, <laughs> or in space for that matter, the reason for physical transportation will diminish, except purely for pleasure. And I can see a great decline, almost to the vanishing point, in business transportation and a great increase in pleasure transportation because of this communication effect. Communications equipment like this could connect tomorrow's home with the world through electronics. In the 21st century, what will it mean if we choose to communicate rather than commute? Will cities become obsolete? Will a home be a school as well? This reporter visited a mock-up of a room conceived by Philco Ford and designed by Paul McCobb. News and information from anywhere could be received over the equipment here, and outgoing messages could be beamed to any spot on the globe. Now, with this console, we might be connected to a worldwide library system to get text or pictures from any book of any age. A telephone with this telephone to a library somewhere in the world. And then, simple push of the button, and there, information about the past or the future. Now, this room is also a school. Every subject from astrophysics to English might be taught to the children of the 21st century at home. But what if I want to know the flight plan for a 21st century trip to Mars? Well, this console can show it to me. And if I want a permanent copy of it, I just ask the machine. And it comes off right there. Lessons and homework in this communications learning center are done here. The teacher is a computer. Daily charts plot a student's progress in each of his courses. This typewriter can be used to ask or answer questions. Pre-programmed lessons appear on this screen. To answer, I touch the screen with this electronic pointer. Find out I'm wrong, just like high school. So I try again. This time I'll select C here. And I find out I'm right, and an explanation of what a fuel cell is. Without leaving a communications learning center like this, you could get an education, get the news, be entertained. And all this equipment is possible today. There is one major problem. How will we send and receive this new flood of information? When we communicate, waves of varying frequencies carry our messages. The higher the frequency, the more message information a wave can carry. Thousands of frequencies make up our communications network. 
the 21st century, this network could become overloaded. One answer, compress the transmission. One way to do this with telephone calls is to reduce the signal to its essentials. First, unnecessary portions of the transmission are removed. Next, the signals are squeezed to take up less space on the telephone line. Now, seven times as many messages can be sent at once. A squeeze message sounds like this. At the other end, the message is unsqueezed and the sound becomes understandable again. I'll be phoning you again in a few days. Look, Wilson, I'll be phoning you again in a few days. Another answer is even higher frequencies that carry progressively more information. This brings us into the frequencies at which light is transmitted. Normal light is a jumble of high frequency waves. It is not intense enough to carry communications very far. A new light, the laser, consists of orderly coherent waves that travel in an intense beam. Because of light's high frequency, 250 million telephone calls could theoretically be carried by one laser beam. Today, short-range communications are carried on invisible laser beams. Uh, do you want me to clear the barges out there so you can come out and I'll talk? Just at least 10 feet in there because they put you on to get a bucket in your pocket. Right on. Take the them away and get up on the bow and put a line up. Uh, at least 10 feet. Despite breakthroughs like the laser, future communications could still be crowded. John R. Pierce of the Bell Telephone Laboratories. I think that uh, communication, even uh, of mass communication, will to some degree outgrow the airwaves eventually. And we will have more and more of it by wire or by millimeter waves going through hollow tubes called waveguides or through laser beams, which can carry ultimately tremendous amounts of communication, uh, but which will have to be protected also from the weather, probably. So they, too, would go through pipes. I think that. Uh, uh, ultimately, a large fraction of things, even things that now ordinarily go uh, by radio, will uh, perhaps have to go by some guided means. Lasers not only carry sound, they make startlingly real three-dimensional pictures. This image was created by Professor Emmett Leith at the University of Michigan. He used a revolutionary new kind of photography with lasers. It is called holography. Holography uses no camera, no lens, no shutter. Two laser beams are used. Imagine a triangle. At the apex, two laser beams. In one corner, an object to be photographed. In the other, a photographic plate. One laser beam shines directly on the plate. The other bounces off the object and then hits the plate. When the two beams strike the photographic plate, their waves meet like crossing ripples from two stones tossed in a pond. The result is this smudge-like pattern. This is called a hologram. To unlock a holographic image, a fresh laser is beamed through the plate. The plate becomes a window beyond which an eerie three-dimensional image floats in space. Holography using three different colored lasers produces a three-dimensional image in full color. Something like holography might be the key to full color, three-dimensional television. In the 21st century, television may also provide us with permanent copies of what we've seen. This reporter spoke with business consultant and computer expert John Diebold about what could be a revolution in publishing. You can think in terms of worldwide publishers, and you may very well end up with an international newspaper being able to be transmitted this way. In other words, if you watch the CBS Evening News on television, you'd also get a printed version of it. Yes, of the news. And I, I, I think the, the interesting thing there is that um, today when we think about that, we think of having the New York Times come out of the TV set. But of course what will happen is that we'll have something which is new. You may edit your own newspaper. You may um, um, set into the TV the fact that you're interested in lots of business news and only a minimum amount of sports or you want all the book reviews and nothing about the stock market or your own little profile of interest with a smattering of general news but a great deal about local political events and this is what will be printed out and no one knows at this point but I think the one thing that is clear is it won't be what we do today. It, you won't print 
this morning's New York Times out of the television set, when you can, you'll have a, a hybrid medium. You'll have something between TV and print. We'll have 3D color pictures on the screen. We'll have um, lithographic quality in the printout. But it will be, in editorial terms, it'll be a new medium. Mm -hmm. And the ability to have a dialogue between the man and the machine is increasing every day. Each day that goes by, each day that we draw closer to, to, to the turn of the century, we start having a easier ability to deal with the machine. The technicians call this the man-machine interface. But the ability to communicate with the machine becomes easier. MIT professor Joseph Weizenbaum carries on a dialogue with a computer through a typewriter. A computer can play many roles depending upon how it's programmed. I have told the computer that it's to understand what I'm saying, say in the context of, uh, of being a, a doctor. If I then tell the computer, uh, for example, uh, my head hurts, I expect the computer to, uh, uh, to respond to that uh, as, as a doctor might. And the computer responds by saying, tell me more uh, about your pains in general, which is a quite reasonable uh, response for a doctor to give. Well, suppose I say, uh, my toe hurts too. It says, uh, you see some psychological reason why your toe should pain you. And this tells us something about the kind of a doctor we may be talking to. That is, the, the context that we've, that we've specified for the computer to be in. Well, suppose I say, no, uh, I don't. It says, don't you really? Uh, so apparently it's, uh, it, it's suggesting that perhaps I do, in fact, see some reason why these two phenomena should be connected, and so on. Now, uh, suppose now I ask uh, the computer, now in this context, uh, some question, or say some simple arithmetic question. Uh, for example, how much is two and two? Now, that's not a reasonable thing to ask a doctor when you're visiting him in his office, and the doctor or the computer in this context now comes back and says, why do you ask? Suppose I say, because I want to know. And the response is, is that the real reason? Uh, well, I think in general we see here uh, that uh, in, in a certain sense, the computer insists on remaining in this particular context and uh, in, in, in effect in understanding what we say to it in that context. And the computer has been instructed to be polite so that, for example, if I say to it, thank you, then this is a clue to it that, uh, that uh, I'm finished with it. And uh, it comes back with, you're quite welcome, come again. The next step toward bringing men and machines closer together is turning typing into talking. Some computers have learned to talk with borrowed voices. This man is calling up a computer. He wants to check a bank balance. He asks his question with a punched computer card. The computer will answer with words previously recorded by a human voice. It assembles these words into the appropriate sentences. Account number 01834318849. Balance is 1,088.52. Computers may make cash and checks unnecessary in the 21st century. To buy something, you just need a punched card in your pocket and a talking computer in your bank. The Bank of Delaware in Wilmington is experimenting with such a service. When you want to pay, the clerk calls the bank's computer. card identifies your account. A talking computer verifies your credit. Account number 01-929620008. Balance on this account is good. The purchase amount is automatically transferred to the store's account. You're watching Sleepcore Pleasant Dreams.
technology, married to imagination. The Holiday Fitness and Racket Club in Rockville, light years ahead of the rest of the world in facilities and programs. But you have only till Saturday at 10 p.m. to save half on pre-opening charter memberships. Call 984-6262. The Holiday Fitness and Racket Club in Rockville. It's what the future of fitness is coming to. Call 984-6262 before Saturday at 10 p.m. and save 50%. Uh, I mean, it may, may sound strange, but the very first Apple I that was ever built was actually given to a person back in the days before computers were ever heard of, who wheeled it into fourth through, and taught fourth through sixth graders a little bit of the elements of what a computer is. The uh, virtue of the computer in the classroom is that the, it requires a user, not, not a watcher. What we do in science is we build models. We do most of our testing with models. We do most of our thinking with models. And then later on, if we're honest, we try and relate these models back to the outside world. And these models are our voodoo dolls. They used to be built in mathematics. Now they're being built uh, in increasing form on the computer. So simulation is what the computer is all about. And uh, all the different ways you can simulate things are uh, what the computer's destiny is. The biggest problem teachers have is motivating students to want to learn. And if the computer can relieve the teacher of that uh, uh, burden, because the teacher today is competing with television and competing with a lot of distractions, if the teacher has that tool to uh, bring the kids to a kind of a, a fever pitch of wanting to complete a task, wanting to see something accomplished successfully, then I think that this will become a tremendous resource for the teacher. It won't supplant the teacher. Life is wonderful, huh? And you want to get that over to the kids. Look, you can go over the top and come to, around to this side and look at it from the other side. Good. Now, what about what's going on on the inside? Well, the crater up here was from an eruption a long time ago. You can see the cracks where the lava came down. top of the volcano. The crater was caused by an eruption a long time ago. Show us where the magma is. The, ma the part is the magma underneath the Earth's crust. Heat from the magma creates pressure against the surface of the Earth. When volcanoes erupt, the magma comes out through the cracks in the Earth's crust, and the cracks are called fissures. I knew that. What's it really look like? This is what a volcanic eruption looks like in real life. being able to speak and get natural responses, the metaphor of kind of a human personality in the computer, um, certainly I think that's one of the, the big directions that computers will go. The computer having very personal characteristics, speaking in a natural human voice, elements moving on the screen as the computer describes what's happening, still giving the, the advantage of a computer, which is it's interactive. The student can back up, ask a question about something, collaborate with a friend, and it doesn't run by continuously like uh, television does. I'm not sure to what extent computers are being used now for adult literacy, but I feel persuaded that it, it's a much more effective tool uh, than, than uh, the school situation for most adults because the computer's not threatening. An adult, if you have a good program, an adult can sit down with the computer and make mistakes and not be reprimanded and not feel humiliated even though the, uh, the teachers may not want to humiliate the student, a lot of times someone who's 30 or 40 years old is so ashamed of not being able to read uh, that uh, the, the interaction with other people may be quite intimidating, whereas the computer is not. After filling the engine with oil, the coil wire should be grounded and the engine cranked by the starter motor until the oil pre... What's this word? Pressure. Oh, pressure. Until the oil pressure gauge reads 10 pounds. Would you like to go on to lesson six? Uh, no, I, I want to read this.
The Oakland A's begin an important home stand tonight. Well, of course, I would expect it to be able to accept speech. Uh, keyboarding is a truly primitive way of getting information into the machine. So to begin with, I would want it to do that. Almost as important to me, and I think vitally important to the world, is I want it to do automatic translation. Even if that translation is not 100% perfect, there's no such thing. I want to be able to read books in Swedish and Japanese and Hungarian and Arabic and Hebrew and Greek and Chinese, and I can't. Well, I think the, you know, the supercomputers of today will be the desktop computers of tomorrow. And the, I mean, there are two kinds of things that you can do with more computing power. You can do more of what you want to do now uh, faster, and you can occasionally do some things that you would be unthinkable to do now. This is some pretty convincing stuff. I'll need all the ammo I can get from a meeting with Professor Thorndike and his committee of invertebrates. Look, see how the engine creates a lot of turbulence, especially at high speeds? So? Well, this causes a lot of noise and also creates a certain amount of drag. Much like? Thorndike. The oscillation starts inside the nozzle and the turbulence really increases outside. Did you try flaring the exhaust nozzle? Sure, I've tested a lot of possible angles. I noticed that the oscillation is a lot lower when you have something like this, about 14 degrees. Hmm. We should test this. Can you talk to Gavin about a prototype of the nozzle? Sure. And can you add these changes to the specs? Sure. <laughs> can you meet with Thorndike? Get out. The implication of this much computing power at a very affordable cost is partly one of those because of the fact it's so radically different than anything we could have ever expected, where the, the very hugest supercomputers of, of my lifetime, early in my lifetime, are now equaled by inexpensive personal computers that you can buy everywhere and everyone can own. It's like you can't even say, where, the, where is this going to go? So the ideas about hypermedia and what their possibilities can be have been around for a long time. And they have always been to be able to cut your own trails through information of your own, other people's information, weave in your stuff with other people. The trails now constitute a, a new kind of a book. Select the nozzle. Modify. Let's see noise test three again. Okay, change the nozzle dimensions to the ones in noise test three. Great. Let's see performance requirements. Regulations. Noise. Link the noise regulations to the nozzle dimensions. Nozzle dimensions. Uh, I don't know what the next extension of that is, except that, uh, an enrichment of it uh, through going through, uh, looking at a, uh, a book of mine, not simply as a page of text, but also having behind that page of text is uh, uh, access to additional information that enriches the text. Supplement it with documents, original source material, writings of the period, and begin to get what every historian would love to achieve, which is a, a real sense of the time. So if we had a machine that we could play games with and uh, take each subject to its farthest point, you could say to the machine, how come I love dinosaurs so much? Show me all the covers of the science fiction magazines my father and my grandfather grew up with that caused us to become scientists or technologists, to fall in love with the future. The things that make us want to live forever. That sort of machine, I think, would be absolutely incredible for a child to play with. We're all doing the same thing, same work, but we're doing it in different ways. And saying, my God, isn't this exciting? Huh? Uh, what we have here to prove that mankind has moved from here to here and can move even further to here.
useful robots will be those with mobility and versatility. ODEX-1, like other prototypes, proves these goals are feasible. Radio signals to ODEX's self-contained computers allow it to adapt to a variety of environments. It can narrow to maneuver through tight spaces, lower its body to clear the door frame, then raise again to normal height. But scientists generally agree it will be a very long time before robots come close to moving as humans do. Natural walking is an amazing combination of sight, coordination, and balance. Each pair of legs is controlled by its own nerve center, which link up to control the overall walking pattern. It's this system that has been imitated in the world's first commercial walking machine, Odex-1. Odetix is interested in uh, developing walking machine technology because there are a number of applications where uh, a machine that provides its own locomotion by walking on legs is a very definite advantage where uh, other concepts uh, uh, fail. An example of this is inside man-made facilities, uh, such as nuclear facilities, where the facilities were originally designed for access by human beings on foot, which means stairs and ladders. And these facilities now, of course, are operating uh, with environments where humans can no longer go into these areas, uh, yet there's the need for um, a machine to go in and do uh, inspection and maintenance. ODEX-1 is radio controlled, although it takes care of the guidance of its own legs. It can go up unfamiliar staircases and negotiate doorways. One day, it will have a sense of vision so it can see for itself where to go. The ability to avoid obstacles is essential if the machine is to work with man. In the uh, man-made environment where the accessible pathways for the robot are very confined and very cluttered, it's, it's extremely important uh, that the uh, walking machine be able to place its feet at very precise locations uh, based on the available uh, foot space. For this reason, we have opted to build a statically stable uh, walking machine concept and uh, with that statically stable concept we've chosen six legs because this affords the greatest speed efficiency while still maintaining static stability Watching Sleepcore, media for insomnia. This is an emergency meeting of all departmental heads of the XYZ Furniture Company. That's Mr. Armstrong, the president. He called the meeting to discuss the loss of a $75,000 order. A 
Uh, this has been one of several large orders lost in the last few months. According to Mr. Johnson, sales manager, it was production's fault. But according to the production manager, Mr. Smith, his department was not at fault. Let's take time out and analyze why this order was lost. February 1st, the $75,000 order for Futura chairs was signed at the customer store for delivery before March 15th in time for their annual spring sale. February 4th, the order was mailed to the plant. February 6th, it was received at the plant. February 8th, the order went through a credit check where there was a two-day delay because of the amount of small orders being checked. February 13th, the order was typed in the sales department. A couple of new girls were being trained on the job, uh, thus causing another delay. February 14th, the order was checked for accuracy by another girl. A mistake was found and it had to go back. More lost time. February 15th, the order was received at production control. February 18th. A clerk checked the inventory status of Futura chairs. He found there was not enough in stock to fill the order. February 19th, the order was passed on to the production scheduling group to determine how soon the necessary chairs could be built. By February 20th, the production schedule had been analyzed. It was found necessary to revise all production plans in order to meet the March 15th delivery date. February 21st, based on this new plan, the supply of raw materials was checked. Not enough in stock to even begin filling the order. More raw materials had to be obtained. February 22nd, the order for raw materials was typed, verified, and signed. This was done more rapidly than usual because now they realized they were in trouble. From February 22nd to March 4th, they waited for the raw materials. Meanwhile, preparations were made so production could begin as soon as the materials arrived. March 5th, the raw materials arrived and production began. March 19th, production completed. March 21st, the furniture was finally ready for shipment, but it was six days too late for the customer's spring sale. Order canceled. So the furniture went to the warehouse instead. The bottleneck was paperwork. Actual production took only 16 days, but it took 28 days of paperwork and delay before production could even start. However, the problem did not end there. According to the chief accountant, the profit and loss statement for February showed that they had built up their warehouse inventory of colonial style furniture to $150,000. This style was not selling as well as predicted, so they had to cut the price to $120,000 to get rid of it. This meant a loss of $30,000. To make matters worse, still more colonial was in production. By this time, everyone was well aware of the problem. But what was the solution? How could management control be improved? Hire a hundred more clerks? No. There's a more practical solution. Industry has a powerful new tool for handling paperwork operations and for improving management control. Electronic data processing. Electronic data processing. Genie of business. Almost like a story out of the Arabian Nights, electronic data processing has suddenly appeared as a new helper for the businessman. A machine with many of the characteristics of the human mind, it follows management's instructions exactly. This is not tomorrow's dream. It is equipment ready and available for use today.
There are electronic machines available in many price ranges, including large equipment, medium size equipment, and even small equipment that can be applied to numerous computation problems in business. What are the major characteristics of this new management tool? First, and perhaps most significant, is the computer's ability to carry out a long series of operations without human intervention. To accomplish this, the machine has stored inside it all of the different procedural steps that it must follow. When there are several alternative procedures that might be used in a given case, the machine automatically selects the right procedure and follows it. All of these procedures can involve many thousand individual instruction steps. The second major characteristic is that of memory. The machine has two basic types of memory. One being a large volume type of memory for storing the files of the business. The other is a small volume, high speed memory where all of the procedural steps are retained. To illustrate the large volume memory, a life insurance company might have several hundred thousand active insurance policies. All of the information on all of these policies can be retained on tapes such as these and the machine could search automatically for a desired policy record. The third major characteristic of these machines is speed combined with accuracy. Instructions and data stored on this rotating magnetic drum can be selected by the machine in a few thousandths of a second or can be selected from these magnetic cores in a few millionths of a second. Reports for management can be printed out at fantastic speeds also. This printer can print up to 10 lines per second. From the teletype or from typist, information on punched paper can be fed directly into the computer. In watching an electronic data processing system in operation, you are struck by how few people are involved. This impression is misleading. There are more people behind the scenes than first meets the eye. In fact, the real challenge for electronic data processing is getting properly trained people. There is an urgent need for systems engineers who lay out the broad procedures under which the system will work. Then there is the need for skilled programmers and coders who write the detailed procedures for the machine. A new type of machine operator is needed who understands the operation of the machine and can get the work out on time. Tape librarian and tape changers who make sure that the file tapes are properly identified. And accurate data recorders who enter the information into the system. Eventually, we will see the work of the automation engineer, where the computer will directly instruct the machine tools in the production shop as to what parts to make and how many to make. The machines are here. Automation of the office can be a reality. Electronic data processing is truly a genie which can improve the competitive position of a firm, and it is here now. To understand how these systems can benefit management, let's see how they operate. First, input. As a sales order is typed, the same information is punched on a paper tape and then transferred to magnetic tapes. One full typewritten order is stored on about one inch of tape. The magnetic tape then becomes the file of the sales orders arranged alphabetically by customer name. All information ordinarily contained in several filing cabinets can now be stored on one reel of tape for faster reference. Next, processing. The electronic system includes a computer which performs functions such as checking, posting, analyzing, scheduling, summarizing, statistics, inventories, and so on. These processes reduce the mass of input data to the key information necessary for effective management. This one system operates faster and more efficiently than innumerable clerks. A high-speed printer translates this information in machine language into written human language, such as credit reports, shop orders, inventory reports, accounting reports, and so on. But computers will do more than clerical work. They can present to management essential data for more efficient control. For example, suppose the electronic system predicts 
not enough in stock for anticipated orders. Management is notified and can take action. Suppose actual sales are greater than predicted sales. The high-speed electronic system would detect such a trend immediately and would automatically compute a revised sales forecast. This allows management to adjust production to avoid bottlenecks. All this takes place at a speed impossible for any number of clerks. And now back to the XYZ company. How would this speed, accuracy, and greater control have saved their $75,000 order? First, sales orders would be typed and the paper tape punched at the numerous XYZ sales offices throughout the country. The tape would be airmailed or fed into a teletype line. The customer file tape unit would spin to locate the customer's record. And the processing dean would check his credit rating. If found satisfactory, the processing machine would go to the second tape unit, the furniture inventory file. The system would check the inventory level of Futura chairs. If there were enough, it would automatically order shipment from the warehouse. However, if the inventory were too low, as happened with Futura, it could notify management immediately. Management could then take action and use the electronic system to schedule the necessary production. Raw material supply would be checked automatically. If there were not enough raw materials in stock to build the required chairs, the machine would print out a purchase order. With the issuing of this order, the paperwork would be completed. This speed and efficiency would have saved 20 days for the XYZ company. The production deadline could have been met and the $75,000 order would have been saved. But the advantages of electronic systems go far beyond this for XYZ, in fact, for everybody. For example, the consumer will pay lower prices. The customer will be assured of earlier deliveries. The salesman will have better customer relations. The employees will be engaged in more supervisory work and a less monotonous routine. The controller will always have up-to-the-minute financial reports. The department heads will have fewer crises and the stockholders will have less of their investment tied up in inventory. Management will benefit most directly. The electronic system will provide all necessary data in time for effective forecast and control.